So good morning. I think we'll go ahead and get underway. I wanted to thank everybody for being here today. I feel like I've been saying uh, thanks for coming to our workshops. It's a very busy time of year for the last two years at any given time of the year, but this is actually the first week of classes on campus and really appreciate people taking time to be, be there. Uh, my name is Will Ingle. I'm a strategist for Open Education Initiatives at the CTLT, and I'm joined by my colleagues. Um, and Trish and Pauline, I'll let you introduce yourselves. Sure. Um, I'll go first just because I muted myself faster. <laughs> My name is Trish. Um, I work for the Center for Teaching and Learning, Teaching Learning Technology, um, and as well as part of the Institute for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning um, in the capacity of an evaluation and research consultant. Thank you, Trish and Will. And yes, yeah, my name is Paulina, and I'm also um, part of the ISOTL Institute, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning at the CTLT. And I work as a SOTL facilitator and evaluation consultant as well. So I'm really excited to have Trish and Paulina here talking about evaluating open uh, education resources and open education projects. Um, OER is making a huge impact at UBC. Uh, in the 2020-2021 academic year, so last year we estimated, um, there were roughly 19,000 UBC students who took part in over 60 courses or course sections that had replaced paid uh, textbooks and were using open or freely available resources uh, in their place. Uh, the goals of instructors and faculty who are implementing OER projects are really grounded in the idea of improving learning and enhancing the student experience. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about this, um, to hear Trish and Pauline talk about how do we know if we're implementing OER into our courses or open educational practices into our courses, um, how do we know if those, those projects are actually meeting the goals that we set for them. Um, so before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that UBC, which is hosting this session, is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And as many of us are still working virtually, I'd like to acknowledge that here in the lower BC mainland, we're often on the unceded territories of many different um, Coast Salish people. And outside of this area, we may be on the territory of many different indigenous peoples. And when I acknowledge that I'm um, on the territory of the Musqueam people, it's rooted in the understanding that I, as a member of UBC, am privileged to be working uh, in a territory that is not my own. And then because this workshop is focused on open education and because uh, my role is specifically focused on open education, I also do like to acknowledge um, that much of open ed is grounded in Western notions of copyright law and ownership. And these notions can be in tension with indigenous and traditional ways of knowing. And we're not gonna be talking about those tensions in this session, but we do have an upcoming workshop in March that we'll be talking specifically about those tensions. So I'll drop a link into the chat um, in a sec, but I do just like to acknowledge that upfront that those tensions do exist. Um, and with that, I'm really excited to turn it over to, to Trish and Paulina to talk about evaluating OER projects. Awesome. Thanks so much, Will. Um, so I'll kick things off. Um, as we get started, um, just a reminder that the session is being recorded um, and we're happy to share the slides with you um, after the fact. Do feel free to share any questions in the chat. Um, Paulina and I will be interchangeably monitoring them and hopefully be able to answer your questions along the way, but we should also have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so just some uh, objectives to, to outline the session today. So hopefully as a result of this session, um, you'll be able to understand how evaluation can increase your project success, um, as well as have some clear evaluation objectives. So uh, really honing in on what the intended outcomes and uh, how to measure what that success looks like for your project, um, as well as provide some ideas on potential methods that will help you reach these goals. Um, just a reminder, this is really the beginning of a conversation. You might be at different stages in evaluation, um, but this is just a, a very quick one hour session. Um, so, you know, we're, we're here to kind of provide some, some tips and tricks and overview, um, but we're also here to, um, if, if you need support um, or further guidance in, in evaluation at any stage, do please feel, to feel free to reach out to us. Um, and an outline of the session overall, um, we'll be looking at some big picture of evaluation, um, kind of what evaluation is and what the different components of it are, um, as well as doing some activities with you, um, looking at defining your intended outcomes and impacts, um, as well as discussing what your evaluation question might be, um, whether you have it solidified or not. 
Um, and then we'll talk about some different evaluation measures and approaches, and then um, some overall considerations that you should think about when embarking an evaluation. And then we should have some time at the end for Q&A. Okay, so you are, you're all here because, um, you know, you have some evaluation goal in mind, presumably. Um, so hopefully this shouldn't come as too much of a surprise to you. But um, when we think about evaluation and kind of what the value of it is, um, it's really about making sure that your project outcomes are met and that your plan is working as intended. So you know, you've set out to create some type of OER um, and it's not just a matter of creating it. Um, that's well and good in one piece of it, um, but is it working? Um, what about it is working? Is it, uh, you know, helping students learn better? Is it saving students money? Is it making things easier for the teaching team? Is it allowing you to incorporate new elements that you wouldn't previously be able to? Um, an evaluation can help you answer those questions. Um, Um, so evaluation in the sense helps you, um, as I mentioned, determine if your objectives or goals are being met. Also improving project design. We think about evaluation often as an iterative process. So um, you might go through and ask some specific tar targeted questions um, in one way. And by asking those questions, uh, you'll be able to learn something perhaps that you didn't know before, uh, which could lead you to make some changes to the design or to the resource itself as well as just making those informed decisions. Um, for those of you that are here as OER fund holders, just a reminder that project evaluation is a required component um, when you complete your final report for the project. Okay, so um, we look at evaluation, uh, as I said, as this iterative process um, and these different stages include uh, defining your evaluation or research questions, looking at different measures. So what, what, is, what is it that you're hoping to evaluate? Uh, so for example, something like, you know, does this open, um, open resource uh, impact student motivation or student learning? Um, choosing an evaluation approach from there. So how will you know um, if that's actually happening? So thinking about things like doing surveys or focus groups, interviews, then preparing and piloting um, your evaluation uh, measure and then collecting and analyzing that data. So just to give us a sense of kind of where people are at and then we can maybe spend a little bit more time on each of these areas depending, um, I'm just going to share a poll with you and just ask that you select um, which stage of evaluation you're at. Um, and it's okay if you're really, you know, really at the start of defining questions, you haven't even started to define the questions, you're just thinking about defining your questions, that's okay. Um, it's possible that you've already gone through and collected some data and now you're kind of trying to figure out how it applies to you. Um, so just give a moment for people to fill this out. And it's possible some of you aren't even doing an open project yet, you're really just kind of starting to think about this process and that's totally okay as well. Okay, so it looks like most of you are in um, the defining question stage, so uh, just more than about half of you, but some of you are a little bit further along, um, already doing some um, preparing and piloting, or um, in one case, having already collected and analyzing some data. So that's helpful for us to know. It looks like more at the front end, um, perhaps some of uh, that piece um, will be useful. We do have some content on that, so great. So um, as I said, this first stage that we uh, consider is really in defining that question. And in developing a question, we, we tend to break it down into two pieces. So one piece being um, the practice, what it is that you're hoping to evaluate, um, and then what the intended outcome is. So what impact you hope that practice to have. Um, and so uh, I'm going to work through um, some examples as we as we talk. But again, we're we're really in this context. We're looking at practice as uh, an open access resource. So um, this could be something else in a different teaching context. But for the purpose of today's session, we're really focusing on that as the the practice or sort of output what you're hoping to evaluate. Um, and we recognize that that resource could come in many different forms. So a textbook, a website, uh, a teaching tool. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then when thinking about 
outcome, um, we think about that as what impact you want the practice to have. So just some examples here, and we'll work through some more in a, in a moment. Um, are things like performance, um, a motivation or attitude change, um, increased awareness to different diversity issues, um, and the list goes on and on. Um, so as I said, I'm just going to work through um, an example here with you. So um, in this example, I, if I was, um, Will had thankfully given me some open um, OER fund resources. Um, I'm looking at developing an open self-study quiz database for all sections of Psych 217, which is um, a, a wide research methods course that loads of students take. So I want to create this database um, that can be used. Um, so that's the practice. So what it, excuse me, what it is that I'm, the, the resource that I'm creating. Uh, and then thinking about the intended outcome, um, in my example, my goal is to increase student learning and knowledge as a result of these resources. Um, and it's really important to kind of lay out these two pieces clearly before you build your evaluation question. Um, and we'll get to that stage in a moment. So here um, with activity one, um, I'm going to share. So we have some worksheets that we've put together and we're gonna work through a few of the activities together. Let me just share this in the chat. Um, so I invite you to make a copy of these worksheets um, and keep them and use them both today um, in this session as well as as you develop um, your evaluation plan. Um, but what I'd like you to do is um, open the worksheets uh, and then under activity one, um, which provides a similar listing like this, um, select which outcomes you hope to achieve from your OER. Um, so think about you know, what it is, what are the goals of your project? And it's possible there's something else on here that's not, um, or there's something else that's not on here that um, you're hoping to evaluate as an outcome that you're hoping to look at. Please feel free to share that in the chat. Um, this is a list that we've put together based on other um, teaching and learning projects that we've supported at UBC, but it's certainly not the be all end all. So we're always happy to learn about different areas that people are investigating. Um, and then what I invite you to do is uh, just annotate on this slide itself um, and let us know once you've kind of thought about what your intended um, outcome is, let us know what it is. Um, so I'll give people um, just a couple minutes to do that. Uh, and during that time, please feel free if you have questions um, to type them in the chat or just pop, um, unmute yourself and, and let us know. Did you want us to annotate this slide? Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Just to, to kind of get a sense of where people are at. It's sort of a nice, we're a pretty small group. So it's nice to sort of see what areas people are looking at and get a sense of, of where the work is. Awesome. I'm seeing lots of uh, check marks coming up. This is, this is great to see. Um, so it seems like a lot of um, folks are interested in this area of exposing students to different ways of learning. Um, and that's fantastic. Um, see uh, a comment in the chat here. Um, another one, students awareness um, slash exposure to diverse voices. Awesome. Uh, um, and I'm seeing that you're having some trouble putting your answers in the document. Um, if you mean the link that I shared, you'll have to make a copy of it. So we actually, the, those worksheets are for you to use um, for developing your own evaluation plan. So we don't want everyone writing their answers on a shared document there. So um, in the Google Doc, you should be able to select to um, save it either as a, a Word document or save it um, as, a, as a Google Doc yourself. Uh, save a copy, sorry, I should say. Great, okay. Just in uh, the interest of time, I'm gonna move on from here. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, it's always interesting to kind of hear and see where, where people um, are thinking about um, their projects and, and what they have in mind. And I think helpful to kind of yeah, see what other areas there are that people that you might be interested in. Okay, so building on that, um, now that you've set out um, your ideas of what your practice are and your intended outcomes, um, this is a good way to sort of build into what your evaluation question or questions are. Um, so from the example that I um, mentioned earlier, looking at uh, developing open self-study an open self-study quiz database um, with the goal of increasing student learning and knowledge, um, I could build an evaluation question, which is how do the self-study quizzes increase knowledge of core concepts? And 
what you'll notice about this evaluation question, and it's one small change that um, I recommend um, making when you're building an evaluation question, is the use of the word how. Um, so this could be easily phrased as, do the self-study quizzes increase student knowledge of core concepts? And that gives you a simple yes, no question. Um, but as part of evaluation is really moving beyond that yes, no, is it working, is it not working? But why is it working? Why is it not working? What's working well? What's not working well? Um, so thinking about that framing of the question also sets you up um, when we get to the stage of evaluation methods, um, building those questions that you would actually ask um, the students or the teaching team or, or um, who's, whoever you're interested in targeting. Um, so for this next activity, um, I'd like you to again um, go to your worksheet and um, in activity two on the next page, build in um, some evaluation questions. So again, even if you're not really at the stage of being ready to get there, thinking about what you indicated on the previous slide as what the outcomes were and, and the practice um, or the resource you're developing, what type of questions might you ask? Um, so just ask that you spend um, maybe just two minutes thinking about what your evaluation question might be, and then um, making some notes for yourself, either um, on your worksheet or on a piece of paper. And then uh, I also invite you to share them in the chat, and Pauline and I will kind of scroll through them and um, provide some feedback on that framing, or um, we can provide some clarification if you're like, does this sound like I'm down the right path, or is this too broad or too specific? Um, so I'll just sit quietly for maybe three minutes while people do that, and then uh, hopefully we can have some discussion around the questions people share. Sorry, Lindsay, I see your question here. Um, how many outcomes are too many outcomes? <laughs> that's a, that's a, great, a great question. Um, I think it's fine to sort of dream big and think about all the things that you're interested in asking um, or that would be informative to your project. So I think it's fine to start off and just, you know, take off as many of those boxes as you're interested in. I think from there, um, I would say focusing on two or three for your first round of evaluation, um, just because it's not so simple. Say you're interested in student motivation. Um, it's rare that you would ask just one single question to students about motivation. So you kind of have to think about for every outcome that you're interested in, that you'll have a couple questions that you'll wanna ask about that piece. And so um, both in terms of for yourself, in terms of analyzing and processing the data and um, students or the teaching team, whoever will be answering those questions for their sanity, um, you kinda wanna focus on just a few areas to start. Um, and I think that's a, a good way to start kind of for that first iteration of evaluation. Um, in projects I've supported, oftentimes, you know, we'll start off with a few questions and we'll get really clear data on one or two of them. You know, students, students do really feel like the resource is valuable. They are feeling like they're learning from it. And that will help generate a new question that's maybe tied to another outcome. Um, or, you know, I, I can kind of move on from that and say, okay, it seems like this resource is really helping students um, stay motivated or understand the goals of, a specific assignment or something like that. Okay, I can leave that one aside and then build in like, okay, well, what, but what about this other piece? Um, so I think starting off with maybe two or three um, or even just one um, is totally, uh, totally fine and a good way to start. And then focusing on those as the, as the forefront. And yeah, that can take a bit of time to kind of narrow down, okay, well, which ones are most, most important and most valuable? Um, and it depends also on kind of the, the depth of the outcome that you're interested in. So it'd be easy to say something like, looking at student learning, you could just say, well, their grades are improving. That's enough, that's all I'm interested in. Um, but many of us, I think, don't want to, don't want to, don't like to think about learning as just you know, a single grade. And so there's a little bit more richness to it. So it also depends on kind of the, the depth of the outcome as well. Um, hopefully that answered your question. So um, if anyone else has any questions or they'd like to um, share their, their research questions that they, or evaluation questions that they've developed, please feel free to post them in the chat. Um, we have a few minutes that um, we'd be happy to spend kind of helping people finesse their questions or figure out if they're on the right track. I'm also mindful that it's early and maybe people 
aren't ready yet to share their, <laughs> their evaluation questions and need a little bit more time to process. This certainly isn't meant to be a, you know, at the end of the session, you'll have finalized everything. So um, please don't feel um, like we're trying to rush you through this process at all. Um, we're happy to provide feedback. Also, as I said earlier, um, you know, we take some time, think about this, put it, put it aside. Um, you're always welcome to come back to me and Paulina um, to help get some clarification or guidance. Um, I'm seeing a question here, and other question. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so, how does the resource address the gap in existing resources? Yeah, um, that's that's a that's a great um, other uh, sort of outcome is is sort of, and that's I think a, a much bigger research question in terms of how does it compare to what what is already there, what's already being used. Yeah, this takes it down a little bit of a different route than sort of what we're focusing on today, which um, looks at more um, gathering people data. Um, I mean, that's certainly something that you could think about doing with this question, but kind of looking, pointing more at the literature um, or other experiences and saying, you know, surveying the field. Um, and yeah, um, as, as Pauline added here, what, what is it adding that, that isn't already in existence? Awesome, thank you for sharing that. Okay, I'm gonna move on, just being mindful of time. We have a lot of other content to share with folks. Um, okay, so um, once you've kind of narrowed in your question and um, feel like you've got a few that you're ready to tackle, the next stages are um, identifying um, measures and evalu uh, choosing an evaluation approach. Uh, so, Looking at these, so again, I'm just building on that example that I mentioned earlier. So um, how do the self-study quizzes increase students' knowledge of core concepts? Um, two ways that I might think about measuring that are looking at student performance on knowledge tests, as well as looking at student confidence. Um, and I might think about in this example as um, evaluating those via quizzes, so looking at performance um, the, the grade changes uh, based on quiz performance um, and look at student con confidence um, either by using surveys or focus groups. Um, so the measure is really um, an indicator what will help you find the answers or signal that a change of some kind is occurring. Um, and then your evaluation method is kind of how are you going to do it? Where are you going to find that evidence? What data sources or approach are you going to use? Um, so we don't have time today to work through that and also recognizing that people are still um, earlier on in that sort of developing their research questions. This is something to do once you have that a little more solidified. So we won't spend time on activity three today, but I do invite you to um, go back to those worksheets once you're here and use them to kind of help you frame, um, to think about the measures that um, you could be using. There are some examples there of different ones for different target areas um, and different um, thinking about the evaluation method. So I'm gonna hand it over to Paulina to um, talk about some common evaluation methods. Thank you so much, Trish. Um, yeah, so in the poll that we did earlier, actually nobody replied that they were at the stage of thinking about evaluation approaches. So I'm not sure if that's because some of you have already completed that stage. Um, or if you're still all very much in that very first kind of thinking about your research question or what your project um, seeks to do. So I won't spend a lot of time on these slides because I definitely want to make sure that we have enough time for your questions. And I see some more questions kind of popping up in the chat. So um, obviously, if you have questions while I'm moving through the slides, please do um, feel free to unmute your mic and then um, or just pop your questions into the chat. So um, let me see if I can. Oh, Trish, I can't um, advance my slide. Oh, there we go. It's just a bit delayed. We were, there we go. So, um, so common evaluation methods. And so I'll spend a bit of time talking about the most common um, evaluation methods, but this does not mean that there are not other ways that you can evaluate um, um, your project. So interviews, focus groups, and surveys are probably the most common um, methods that we see um, in OER projects, TLEF, and also the Seed projects that we support. 
Um, but there are also other ways that you can do this. So you can um, do it through observation. So looking at how students interact when they're doing certain activities in the classroom. Um, you can look at assignments, um, so quizzes, um, tests. So that's kind of more if you're looking at evaluating like how well students are learning or are their grades improving and that sort of thing. You can also look at journal reflections. Um, I worked with a project um, once that looked at student written responses based on certain activities that they did. Um, but eventually the, the evaluation method that you choose really, really needs to tie back to your question. So um, if you're thinking about, for example, looking at student engagement or how the OER resource helped them understand diversity better, um, those types of things you might want to think about in terms of interviews or focus groups, because you can really elicit rich data. You can look at student experiences, lived experiences in, in different ways than, for example, um, a survey can capture. So it's not to say that there is one approach that's better than the other, but the question will dictate which method that you use. So it's really important to kind of think about those two things um, together. And it's also really important to think about for either me any method that you choose to think about how that information will be used. Um, how, how, how are you going to um, make sure that students have access to that data if they, if they want to um, look at what was done with it, um, making sure how you're going to ensure student anonymity. So all those things need to be um, considered no matter which method that you choose. So um, that's something to, to really think about before you move on. So, Interviews and focus groups, um, as I mentioned, um, these are pretty common, um, usually in the social sciences. I've seen them used um, a lot or in the, in the arts kind of fields um, where instructors are really interested in kind of that, that greater um, picture of student experience. Um, they give you a detailed understanding. They, you know, a lot of stories and narratives come out of from talking to, to students. Um, but usually you only get a small subset of students to participate in interviews and focus groups. Interviews will definitely take a little bit longer to do because usually they're one on one. Um, and oftentimes we need to find um, someone else that who is not the instructor um, to conduct those interviews because of that power dynamic. And so you might want to work maybe with a GRA or a grad student who um, might be willing to conduct some of those interviews for you. So there is a little bit more of the, that time intensity that comes along with interviews and focus groups. The other, the other thing to consider, um, you know, as great as these approaches are, um, they do not often generate high attendance. So oftentimes focus groups, um, are not well attended. Um, I, there was an instructor, I won't mention who in this, who is in, in this presentation today, and we worked really closely on, uh, with focus groups um, a couple of years ago on a project. And we had very, very few students attend the focus groups, but the information that came out of them was really, really enlightening and um, really helped us kind of think about um, how this instructor could move on with the course um, in the next in the next term. So even if you have small numbers, um, don't be discouraged. You can still get really interesting um, data from that. Um, so those are just a couple of things about interviews and focus groups. Um, Making sure that you have a protocol is really important. So having um, maybe like a, an interview guide or something where you can follow along um, as you go with the interviews or focus groups, especially if you're not the one doing it. So just making sure that those questions are being asked and that you're um, asking them equally among all students so that you have the data um, that you need. If you're not familiar with conducting focus groups or interviews, um, learn more about how you can do that. Of course, there's workshops that you can attend um, to learn more about it. But as I said, it's always better to have someone else um, do them for you. And if they're not familiar, then it's always good for them to have a bit of training as well, because sometimes, um, you know, students will share things that uh, you'll, you'll need to just have a little bit of experience in navigating um, some student comments, um, especially that might be sensitive around um, like course material and the instructor and that sort of thing. And always making sure that you record the session with permission because you will not remember everything or the, the grad student that's working with you won't remember um, what the students said, even if they're taking excellent notes. So recording is, is usually recommended um, for that. Are there any questions about interviews or focus groups or anything that you've been really wanting to ask about some of these methods? And we'll talk about ethics a little bit later on if that comes up, but I'll just keep moving. Okay, surveys, surveys are super, super common, um, mainly because they're very, very easy to administer. They're really easy to create. If you use something like Qualtrics, 
Um, even if you have no experience um, designing surveys, Qualtrics is a really neat tool that helps you kind of through different questions and it gives you tips on ways that you can restructure some questions if they're a little bit problematic or um, if they just don't make sense in that in particular orders. Um, yes, and we have a workshop coming up um, at the end of March on survey design. So if you're like, oh, I think I would really love to use surveys, um, then please join us um, for that. And Trish is the survey expert, so she will um, teach you a lot um, about survey design. But they're really great if you have a large number of students. So if you're evaluating something like, you know, student engagement um, and you and you really want to have like all your students participate in that, you're likely not going to get all the students to come to a focus group. So a survey might be a really great way of, of asking some of those questions about, um, you know, did your tool, um, you know, make the students feel excited? Did they learn, did they want to engage with that tool? Did they, did they feel that they could engage with it more than like a textbook or in a traditional um, type of Type of, type of learning tool. So you'll definitely get a little bit more data um, from surveys, but the thing to consider about surveys is that there's not always a good, like there's there's different times during the term when they're really good to, to send out to students. Um, so you have to be really careful and mindful of, you know, around exam times or end of term when students already have so much stuff going on, um, or maybe they're going back home for the summer. So just planning out the time, the timing of the surveys and when you send them out, and that will really determine um, how many number of students you get um, to participate in those. Um, there's a question, if you design survey and our focus groups questions together with former students, I'm going to you to learn more about design. Yes. Are you asking if you if you can do that, Karen, or if, if that's something that we would recommend? Both. OK. <laughs> uh, yes, I would say that's a that's a really great idea. And that's something that's, um, I guess, in line with the student us partners um, kind of initiative and, and and trend that's that's um, really happening right now in, in the university. So um, I would say yes to that. Um, there's, there's probably a little bit of planning involved in involving students. So making sure that, that there is some kind of protocol or, or ethics um, screening there so that they're in, you know, cause they're basically involved as researchers in that, in that project with you. Um, and so, yeah, I would say, sorry, I'm just trying to look back at your comment here. Uh, Yes. And so piloting, piloting with students is always great for a survey, but also piloting maybe with, with faculty um, or any of your colleagues that might want to have a look at your survey just to make sure that it makes sense. Um, sometimes piloting with students, again, we have to consider the time that students um, might be investing in this. So I would, for piloting a survey, I would say I would recommend it with, um, with your colleagues if that's possible. Trish, I don't know if you have any Anything to add to that, I would just say like really being mindful of students' time. Um, and I would just grab maybe like three or four colleagues who could look at it and make sure that the questions that you're asking, um, obviously if they make sense to you, if they make sense to, to other people. But I, yeah, I guess you could pilot it with students as well if they have time and they're willing. But um, I guess I would just be really careful that, um, that they're not overburdened and that they don't feel that they that they have to participate in something like that. So coercion is a, is a huge thing sometimes um, with projects when we when we ask them to get involved. So it really just um, yeah depends on the specific situation. Trish, that's a, an important point. So I just want to make sure if you have anything to add to that. Yeah. So um, Suzanne, I think I'm just looking at your your clarification here, talking about piloting the final product. So yeah, certainly great to kind of do kind of a more targeted. Um, think of something like um, like a user experience um, evaluation where you kind of say like, okay, before we share this with potentially hundreds of students, does it work how, like kind of iron out any bugs? Um, I think that's maybe what you're asking about is kind of getting a sense before you hit the ground running. Um, and definitely we would recommend that. So um, thinking about piloting, you know, before you really dive into specific evaluation questions about, you know, how is it impacting their learning or, um, motivation or um, any of those other questions, just getting a sense of, you know, does it work? <laughs> Are there any major kind of concerns that come up? Um, the other thing with piloting or another way of thinking about piloting that Paulina was kind of, um, I think, alluding to was also piloting your um, your evaluation method materials. So say you have um, a, a list of survey questions that you're going to share or a list of interview or focus group questions, having someone read through them 
um, someone who's not going to participate, just to make sure that, you know, there isn't any strange jargon or, you know, thinking about things like, you know, does it say, um, does, did you like this? And it's sort of like a yes or no, um, how you can change those questions. So getting someone to sort of read through it and, and pilot it in that sense um, is also really useful. Um, yeah, I hope that that kind of helped clarify. And if you don't mind, I'll just jump back to, to Karen's comment that doing that with students who have taken the course before um, is a great way. So, so um, sometimes uh, people might be evaluating sort of student attitudes towards the resources being used and, and um, piloting sort of survey questions or helping design survey questions with students who have been in the course before um, can raise things that, that might be blind spots. So like maybe students get really frustrated that some of the topics aren't covered or, or that um, they can't access those materials in the way they would like to access. And you might not be aware of that. Um, so it's often great to partner with students, I think. Thank you, Will. And Lindsay, you had your hand up as well? Yeah, thanks. I was just wondering, um, and you touched on this a little bit, but you know, surveys, you can get so much more data, um, they're a lot easier. So I guess I'm just wondering what, what would make you lean towards choosing a focus group over a survey? For example, if you're measuring um, student knowledge and engagement, like what, I'm at that stage where I'm like, how, which one am I gonna choose? Um, so just wondering what things that might sway you towards a focus group over a survey. I, I think also it's important um, to mention, maybe I didn't make this clear, that you can do both. Um, you can do um, interviews and and focus groups and a survey um, if, if that's where you want to go. And oftentimes we actually encourage people to sort of use mixed method approach because you can get um, kind of like a wide range of different perspectives from a lot of people um, if you do a survey, but then you can also kind of narrow down on the more like nuances of the, of the student experience through interviews or focus groups. So I think if you're not sure it, and you're sort of like, I, I would like a lot of data. I have a lot of students in my class, for example, and I want to make sure that they all have a chance to you know voice their opinions on this tool. Um, so you can do survey, but then you also might have a couple of questions that you're really curious about that you can maybe only get through um, talking to students. So then you might choose to invite, you know, a small number of them um, to participate in a focus group. And so I think that can make it for a really, really rich project. So you don't have to choose one or the other. And we often encourage um, people to do both. I hope that answers your question. That's great. Thanks. Um, okay, and just one thing about surveys um, is keeping them really short. So um, I would say no more than 10, maybe max 15 questions on a survey, because the more questions that you have, then you really have to think about, well, maybe actually I'm, I am interested in really talking to students and learning more. Um, so maybe a survey is not really um, the best um, method for you. Um, so, and again, keeping in mind that after about five minutes of doing surveys, students tend to <laughs> tend to get really tired. And so you, the, the quality of the responses might, might not be as high. So keeping in mind the, the length of the survey, and then also um, when you choose to administer that survey, like what point in the semester do you think that they're not going to be super overburdened, um, you know, during exams or during reading week when many of them might be away. So things like that. Um, and we can always provide support, you know, with, with questions like that. If you're like not sure, um, if you're thinking about administering a survey, we can always give you um, tips depending on your specific course. So feel free um, to reach out to us about that as well. Um, okay, so preparing and piloting. So we're kind of talking a little bit about piloting a little bit um, and then data analysis and data collection. So I'll just touch very briefly on that. But before that, creating an action plan. So this is really important. Um, and activity four, um, which is the last um, page of that worksheet that Trish shared with everyone, um, has a really good sort of um, framework for how you can sort of set up the, the project in ways that you can make sure that everyone who's in, on board with the project um, knows what they're doing and that you have specific timelines for things. Um, if you're the only one doing the project, it's a little bit easier. But if you're working with, like I said, a grad student or maybe another colleague, it's really important to have those things laid out really clearly. Um, so who's doing what? So who's doing focus groups or who needs to read, you know, design a survey and by what time? Um, and if you are going to be applying for Reb, for example, um, then you need to sort of plan a little bit more in advance because sometimes applying for Reb can take a little bit of time. 
Um, and so, you know, thinking about what things you need, if you are thinking about um, very kind of like practical things, like for a focus group, do you need to organize some food um, or some gift cards for students? So really thinking about all those things um, in advance can really help you in the end and save you lots of time. And then of course, always thinking about how can you tell if a milestone has been met? So um, always going back to that evaluation question. How do we know that what we're doing is working? How do we know that what the kinds of questions we're asking are helping us to evaluate this, this OER project? And so using that activity four, um, I think can really help you when you get to that stage. Um, some things to consider. Um, this is something we see not just in OER projects, but TLEF and Saddle Seed projects. Um, this idea of, oh, I want to really look at something that's interesting in my classroom. Um, but just because it's interesting doesn't mean it's worth evaluating. And so really thinking about not just whether it's interesting or whether you're interested in this thing or you're really passionate about learning more about it, but whether it actually can contribute something to the student learning experience. So it shouldn't just be something that you find interesting, um, but something that can really benefit the students in the end. And so oftentimes a lot of um, people might find that it can benefit students, but really thinking about, does this project benefit student learning? Does it benefit them um, you know, with their engagement? Does it benefit them in learning about diversity? So if you, if you answer no to a lot of those questions and you still think your question is interesting, then it might be worth maybe talking to us about that and we can maybe help you um, uh, redesign your question in ways that actually uh, does benefit the students um, and because they should be really the focus um, of these projects. Um, Thinking also about, you know, I understand my project, I understand my survey, I understand these questions may not necessarily mean that your participants um, understand. And so always, again, going back and piloting, um, as, as Trish mentioned, piloting something before you get going or asking your colleagues um, for feedback on things that you think make sense to you. But then, you know, when you send them out to students, they might be super confused and then your data might be um, not so great um, because they're just answering randomly, perhaps. Um, also thinking about maybe ways of integrating the evaluation into your course. So sometimes um, it's common to have things integrated into a Canvas course. So for example, if you have an assignment um, in Canvas, you can use that as part of your evaluation. So sometimes you don't need to make those um, extra steps and in going into a focus group or creating surveys. Think about how how your course is laid out and think about whether the way that the students are moving through the course, if you can use some of those things that they're already doing as part of your evaluation. Um, and of course, considering the time and the cost um, to administer evaluation. And then of course, the big question that we always get that we probably will, will get at least one question about ethics today, um, which is ethics. Do we need BREB approval? And this is uh, not a clear yes or no um, in, either, in either case. It really depends on what you intend to do in your project. Um, but we do have an ethics workshop. Is it tomorrow, Trish? tomorrow. Um, so if you have questions about ethics um, or whether you need BREB approval um, to collect data from your students for your particular project, then please do join us tomorrow. I believe it's 1 p.m. So um, we, can, we can answer some of your questions there, hopefully. Um, and then lastly here, what evidence um, should look like. We have kind of a nice formula that you can try to use um, and practice to see if this works for your particular project. So thinking about the method, the practice, and then the outcome. So kind of formulating a sentence based around those items. So for example, you can say something like in a Qualtrics survey, which is the method, on the new open resource, that's the practice or the output, the majority of students reported that the new resource helped them prepare for the final exam. And so you're not just saying, oh, I designed a, a new open so a resource for the students um, and they liked it, which doesn't tell us much about um, why they liked it or what they did with it, but framing it as it helped them prepare for the final exam. So that would be the specific outcome of that project. And again, this is helpful for you if you are in that final stage and you have to fill out the, um, the closure report. And so kind of looking at some of these examples and then plugging your specific details of your project might really help you um, to think about whether you are um, kind of meeting those, uh, meeting those evaluation um, criteria. Uh, oh, thanks, Alyssa. Okay, I thought there was something else in the chat. Um, Trish, do you have anything to add to the evidence piece? I'm just gonna let folks yeah. kind of run through it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I just wanted to add again, just for those of you who are here as part of um, an OER fund 
project um, that, yeah, you'll need to provide some information about um, evidence on um, in your closure report. But even if you're not here as, as an official fund holder, um, it's really important to think about this sort of final stage as, as sort of providing, I'd say, like closure <laughs> on the project and sort of what is it that you learned and being able to form a sentence like this is really helpful in, you know, any sharing or disseminating you might want to do um, formally or informally, you know, being able to say to a colleague, you know, we did some focus groups from the focus groups, um, we were able to learn that um, this open website was be, was a, was providing students with um, confidence in their ability to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so just kind of thinking about that framing is really helpful. Um, and again, you know, when you have those clear evaluation or research questions up front, it makes it easier to sort of think about how that answer um, can can be formulated at the end. Um, and I just also just shared in the chat um, uh, an example of a, an OER project um, from a bunch of folks at UBC um, that turned into um, a publication. So um, it's just a really nice example. And it's, it's very thorough and detailed, but um, it provides a lot of information. So I invite people to um, save that to look at another time. Awesome. Thank you, Trish. And our last slide is just uh, additional resources. So if you are uh, later on um, uh, thinking about uh, research methods and designing surveys or questionnaires, we have a bunch of guides um, on our website. So if you just go to the link below, we also have tips on the BREB application process. Um, and of course, you can always attend our workshop. We also have a BREB video, um, which is about 10 minutes long, but it really answers kind of some of the most common questions that we often get about BREB. Um, but you'll find that as well on our resource page. And then, um, of course, really important resource that we have about asking about demographics and gender um, because oftentimes we see surveys that ask a lot of um, kind of demographic information or questions about um, student sexual orientation or race or ethnicity and things like that, that really have not much to do with the project. So it's really important to consider um, the kinds of questions that you're asking and how you're asking them in a survey and whether you need to ask them um, at all. So we have lots of tips and resources on our page as well on that. So please feel to check, check out um, those items. And I guess we have about eight minutes for questions now. So I will leave it open to anyone um, who wants to ask some questions. And Paulina, if I, I can jump in just one sec. So I saw a question earlier from Anita around support for um, evaluation support. And I, I do just want to bring in another resource uh, since not everybody here is um, working on an OER fund project that there is something at UBC called the OER fund. Um, and these are, this is a fund to provide grants um, to developing and integrating open educational resources into courses. Um, and these grants can definitely be used to help support evaluation. So you can add budget items for things like incentivizing students. So we see lots of proposals adding things like gift cards um, to get students to show up for um, focus groups or, or to participate in surveys. Um, you can add uh, uh, grad students or, or assistants for helping do some of that evaluation work as, as well. Um, so I'm just going to put a link into it. We're kind of off cycle. There's two grants. Uh, one grant pathway is called the implementation grants, and these are large grants for $25,000. Um, and we're off cycle. The, the funding cycle for that will be in the fall. Um, generally, we announce them in September and the deadlines in, in November. Uh, but we also have rapid innovation grants, and these are called rapid because uh, we try to get the money out the door faster. And these are small grants that are up to $2,000 um, and they're sort of evaluated on a, a monthly rolling basis. We take proposals in at any time and generally I evaluate them once per month and, and release funding after that. Thank you, Will. Any questions from anyone? Just gonna jump to our last slide here where we have our emails um, and just invite you to <laughs> also write those down. Um, as I said um, earlier, in case you missed at the beginning, um, the session is being recorded. We're happy to share these slides with you so you'll have access to all the links once you've moved on as well. But um, Pauline and I are always here. Um, as we'll mention, um, we can provide some support through um, OER funded projects, but um, we're also happy just to help, um, you know, in, in as much capacity as we can with you know, smaller questions you might have if you're really struggling with narrowing your research question or you just need a second set of eyes on a survey or some focus group questions. Um, we're always happy to step in and spend a few minutes with you.